What's up, Whoa, That's Good fam? Welcome back to the Whoa, That's Good podcast. Today is very exciting because, y'all, I'm actually really excited about this. I'm a huge fan. I actually kind of fangirl whenever I first met you. I don't know if you remember, but I was like, I love you. But we have on the <laughs> podcast Jackie Hill Perry. She is a author, a poet, Bible teacher, artist. I'm pretty sure you're also like a rapper. Uh, you're a mom and a wife. You're pregnant. You, you do a lot of things, girl. Uh, so welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Podcast. Thanks for having me, Sadie. Yeah, no, I really am excited. I came over to you um, when I met you at Jen Johnson's. Well, I had already met you at Passion, I guess, seen you from afar, but I was like, hi, yeah. um, I really want to preach like you. You preach with so much truth. I'm a big fan. And you're like, thanks. And I remember you told me, you're like, you do preach with truth. And that really meant so much to me. And um, yeah. Because, you know, I think sometimes we see people that are different than us and we're like, oh, I want to be like you. And you just really set me in the way of like, hey, you're doing you and that's great. And um, that really meant a lot. So so thank you. Yeah, man, I, I, I watched you from afar and I'm like, this girl, she she's faithful, you know, like mm-hmm. and it, it costs a lot to be faithful. And so I just always value that when I come across it. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much. That's true. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about a few things. Um, Holier Than Thou is your new book. Have it right here. It looks worn in from the way it's designed, but it's actually worn in. I just finished it, and it is so, so good. We're also going to talk about your other book, Gay Girl, Good God, and Your Life. But first, before we get to anything else, I have to ask you the question of the Well That's Good podcast. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever been given? Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I guess what, what comes to mind is uh, my pastor, when I lived in Chicago, he was he always used to counsel me about leadership. And he used to say, Jackie, your your job as a leader is to die first. Mm. And uh, that's so uh, contrary to what we think leadership is, is yep. to, to be the loudest, to be the the first in things. But he's like, nah, the way Jesus led us is by dying. Mm. <laughs> so yep. that, that's been a real strike to my pride a lot of times when I think about it. Wow, that's so good. I remember, um, you know, Bianca Oltoff, she... Mm-hmm. Um, she told me one time, because she studied under Christine Kane, and one time I was like, what's the best advice that you ever learned from Christine? And she was like, well, the first day she said to me, she was like, um, my best advice to you is you have to die to yourself. And she was like, die to yourself, die to yourself, die to yourself. And then she said, and if you think you're dead, you're probably not because you're aware of the fact that you might be dead, which means that you're alive, so die. (laughs) And I was like, that is so true. Die again. Die again, yep. So that is such great advice. Um, Well, my followers and people um, are mostly in college and love a good love story. And I think you and Preston's story is so amazing. But I love how you say, like, before I met, Preston I met God before I really mm-hmm. married Preston I married God so can you kind of tell us your journey of meeting God before you met Preston and then falling in love with him yeah I think what makes our story so unique is that both of us come from backgrounds with uh, just some a level of sexual brokenness um, me dealing with uh, pornography uh, used from the age of what 7 to 19 mm-hmm. same with him uh, sexual abuse uh, him was just promiscuity um, as a means of, you know, attention and identity. And uh, and then I had uh, same-sex attractions and just all the things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I came to faith when I was 19 um, because I, through the power of the spirit, realized that God really was better than everything that I was leaving him for. Yeah. Um, and so when we met, I was a Christian at that point, maybe six months And I was really uninterested in relationships and definitely uninterested in relationships with men. Um, (laughs) So we just kind of had this friendship and it was like a legit friendship where I would give him advice about the relationships he was in. Or if I saw certain girls that I would like, yeah, I don't know if she's that holy. (laughs) And I was just that person. And but but on our separate sides, we just started to get, um, I guess, this attraction to each other that we didn't know what to do with. And so I prayed and I said, God, um, if it's your will for us to be friends, give me the self-control to treat him like a brother and not a crush. 
Mm. Uh, but if it's your will for us to be together, then put it on his heart to pursue me. I didn't know that at the same time, Preston had been fasting wow. for God to show him who his wife was. Wow. And so at the same time that I'm praying, he's praying too. And so we just, That's we ended amazing. up having a conversation and here we are married seven years later with three kids and one on the way. Come on. That is so cool. <laughs> I love it. I love that y'all both like intentionally sought out prayer. And I know you wrote about that in your book that, you know, you really ask God like, hey, if this is not it, then take it away. And I think that a lot of people are scared to pray prayers like that when it comes to mm-hmm. who they're going to be with because they're scared that God will say no. And what if, yeah. what, if they, what if they want him to say yes? But I love how yeah. you were at the point in your life where you were like, if it's a no, like I will obey and it was a yes and so I think that's really cool God's no is a really wise no especially Mm -hmm. when you're thinking about marrying somebody for the rest of your life yep Yep. that's like a legit serious situation yeah (laughs) so I, I need to make sure that this is God's will for real that's so good I love that um I was listening, so I was going way back. Like I said, before we got on, I read both of your books and also listened to so many of your things on YouTube. And I love your poetry. It's so amazing. Yeah. And whenever you and Preston did the one on the fall, it was yeah. so good. How did you even get into poetry in the first place? Yeah, it's honestly real random. Um, so when I became a Christian, I, I decided to go to this community college and I was just really bored. Um, <laughs> I'm studious, but I don't like school. <laughs> hey, I get sense. that. I'm the same way. Like I'll study all day long for a podcast, but when I was in school, I struggled. Hated it. Hated yeah. it. So I'm in seminary now, but I realize it's like I'm studying when I want to study. Yes. I'm not studying what y'all are telling me to study. Yep. Um, and so I was in the class. I was in this English class, and I was just so I was just so bored. <laughs> and I had this 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 urge to write something deep and spiritual. And literally in my mind, I was like, okay, deep people write poems. So let me write a poem. <laughs> so it wasn't That's a thing. Awesome. So I just, I wrote a poem. I put it on Facebook. My pastor saw it. Then he wanted me to start doing poems at church. I had no idea that it would become what it's become become now, you know? Yeah. Um, and then eventually I got connected to a ministry in LA that wanted me to write a, a, a poem about my story. And that poem was the poem that started my public ministry. Wow. So, That's so yeah. cool. I love when you look back at the timeline of your life and you're like, I actually don't know how this happened other than God, or even just a thought that was like deep people write poems, like, and then it led you to what you're doing now. It's, it sounds stupid and random, but it's like, no, that was Providence. Okay, who doesn't love cereal? Cereal is just so good and just brings you to your childhood. However, when you get older, you kind of start to learn that cereal might not be the best thing for you because it's packed with sugars and carbs and all the things. Well, guess what? I have a great solution for you if you're a cereal lover and you're an adult trying to, you know, live a healthier lifestyle. Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is amazing. Let me give you some facts. There are zero grams of sugars, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving with only 140 calories per serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. So it's free of all of these things, but it's so good. Flavors include cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. Subscribe today to Flavors You Love, and you can get your cereal shipped to your doorstep. Not to mention, you're saving more than 25% on your order. You can choose four flavors that you love and edit your subscription to which to switch it up and keep yourself stocked on cereal. Christian and I love Magic Spoon. It's so good and it's also the boxes are so fun and cute in your pantry. So go to magicspoon.com slash woe5. Use our promo code woe5 at checkout to get $5 off your order and try it today. Remember, if you subscribe to Magic Spoon, you get $5 off on top of the 25% saving from subscribing. And Magic Spoon is so confident that you'll love their product. It's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee so that if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money back with no questions asked. Remember, subscribe and get your delicious guilt-free cereal on the regular at magicspoon.com slash woe5 and use my code woe5 to save big. Well, it's really cool because like I read this book and it is it's very deep. It's like 
I mean, you quote like all of these greats in the book, and it, and you're right there saying, yeah, dead people, but you're alive and you're saying things with that much wisdom, and it's like so cool. But I think one thing that people think when they read books like this, or people, they're like, oh, you must have been a Christian your whole life, like you know the word mm. so much, you must have had parents that poured into you and with the word, and like when you read your story, you didn't really. And so, how right. did you learn the word the way that you do, and even learn to teach the word the way? that you do discipleship mm. truly um when i was a christian for maybe a year i moved to la and i moved in with uh because i moved to la to go to a particular church and the head of the women's ministry is who i moved in with and she discipled me for two years and yeah. it's a different kind of discipleship when you live with the person yeah that's <laughs> you true. know like she <laughs> she she didn't have cable Wow. All the only movies that she had had were like Christian movies or apologetic like seminars. Wow. And then every single day she gave me assignments. And when she would come home from work and she was a single woman, so she had margin for all yeah. of that. Right. Uh, she would come home from work and she would challenge me. And one of the first assignments she gave me is she said, I want you to go through the book of John and each sentence. I want you to write your observations. And it wow. took six months. Wow. Right. And so I think that's for real. From the beginning. Yeah. From the beginning, it was like, oh, the Bible really does matter in my spiritual life. And so I think having that foundation has just carried me where yes. I, I don't see the Bible as a as a as a as a box I check off. Hmm. I see it as a means to understand the person of God. It's so period. good. That's so good. I love that. I love you even wrote a part in the book how like it's not just reading the word that makes you holy. Um, and you even talk about how the Pharisees, like they read the word more than anyone. And you would think that that would make them more holy. But in fact, it didn't. Right. But, like, so what is the difference in that? Like for you, like you read the word a lot, but you found the beauty of God as opposed to the Pharisees who read the word a lot, a lot, but didn't. What do you think like the difference is between the two? You have to believe it. Yeah because that was the that was the difference is that they consumed the torah it was mm -hmm. it was a discipline that they, they knew it back and forth even demons devils mm -hmm. they know scripture yeah. <laughs> like uh satan in luke 4 uh when he was tempting jesus he quoted a psalm mm. the difference isn't their their ability to ingest the passages mm -hmm. is that they don't believe what they read. Yeah. And I think that's our tension is that we think quoting it and putting it as an Instagram, Instagram caption is doing the work, yep. but the work is saying, okay, God, this is what you said about yourself in mm -hmm. your word. This is what you said about the world. This is what you said about my heart. Now give me the power to trust that this is true. Yep. And that's what changes our lives is yep. when what we read uh, becomes what we also believe. Yeah, that's good. Come on. Love it. Um, <laughs> so you actually just touched on social media and I just wrote a book that's not out yet called Who Are You Following? And it's a lot about social media, but you started talking about social media and this as one of our idols. But I love how at the end of it, and it, it was so perfect in the book because it was actually a page turn because I was like, yes, yes, yes. Then you hit me with like a whoa when you were like, it's actually <laughs> just a mm -hmm. cover up that social media is their idol. We are actually our own idol. So right. unpack that a little bit because that was really good. Yeah. So I think in a really philosophical way, I think social media has given us a way to experience God likeness, mm -hmm. meaning the fact that you have the access into the lives of people that you do not know and that you don't even have to ask for permission gives you a kind of sense of omniscience mm -hmm. that I, I, I know more things that I would otherwise know of social media or wouldn't otherwise know if social media didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to travel. Yeah. You're able to be in, in Sadie's home. You're able to be in Africa. You're able to be at the MTV Awards. And, and so it's an omnipresence kind of feeling. And mm -hmm. I think that's the attraction. And it's not to say that social media is bad. Social media is very useful for the kingdom, right. but that I think our addictions to it expose that there's some type of pleasure we get out of mm -hmm. this, especially when it comes to our the amount of likes we get yep. or the follows or the comments. There's dopamine yep. Yep. <laughs> being shot in our brain where it feels like a high mm -hmm. because we're getting approval, yep. right? And so I, I think at the end of the day, at, on the surface, it is social media. 
But I think at the root, the idol is us, yep. is that we like to feel central. Yep. We like to have power. We like to be praised. And that's why we want to shut down our social media as soon as we get six criticisms. That, that's because the we truth. Can't, we can't handle it. That's the truth. Wow, that was so good. I was like, there's so many parts in the book that I literally wrote all caps, preach. I was like, and then there's one part I said, sheesh. I mean, it was getting me. I seriously was like, I'm getting saved again. It was awesome. <laughs> one thing you do talk a lot about, and I think both books, and it's really cool because if you read Gay Girl, Good God, and then you read Holier Than Thou, it's really cool because in Gay Girl, Good God, you talk so much about your story, your testimony, what you went through. And then this is almost like the answers that you found. It's like, mm. this is why I am the way that I am, because I've just behold the beauty of God. This is how mm. you become new. But you talk a lot in both books about idols. Um, and it's so silly because when you write it, it's like, well, duh, why would we choose a golden calf? Why would we choose something that we know is not right? But why do you, why do you think that we choose idols instead of God when it seems so obvious whenever you read the words? I think many reasons. One is I think it's easier to trust in a created thing than it is to trust an invisible God. Yep. So if we take Exodus 32, for example, when they create the golden calf, what preceded them creating the golden calf is that they said, hey, we don't know where Moses is. We don't know what's happened to him. So let's create a God that will go before us. Mm. Somehow in them not being able to see Moses, who was a represent a representative of Yahweh for them in many ways, it made them feel as if, okay, God isn't with us anymore. We can't see him. We, we don't know where he is. Mm -hmm. so, so we need something tangible, something we can see that we can put our trust in to lead us and guide us. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same. It's easier to trust a man to make me whole mm. than it is to trust an invisible God to make me comfortable, mm. to give me comfort. Yep. Like, cause it feels weird. It's like, so you're not tangible, but then you're telling me you're the, you're the source of all comfort. And so I have to trust mm. that somehow through some other means you will comfort me. Yeah. Um, but I also think another reason is that, um, our idols are convenient when God often isn't, Yeah, you know, that's um, true. it's, it's, it's kind of like with witchcraft, like <laughs> witchcraft allows us to experience things that God may have said that he's going to give us, but we can get it quicker hmm. by evil means. Hmm. And so it's like, instead of waiting on God for marriage, mm -hmm. we rather just be with the boyfriend and have sex. I don't, I, that's not convenient for yeah. me to, to lay my body down as a living sacrifice, holy mm -hmm. and acceptable unto God. And so it all hinges on faith. Yep. At the end of the day, is that it is so much easier to trust in everybody else than it is to trust God. So good. And that's what that's the that's the root of our idolatry. Come on, that's right. I mean, you really just nail it. It's so good. Hey friends, I want to talk to y'all about Liberty University. So we and the Robertson family are very much Go Flames people because my brother went to Liberty, my sister-in-law, my brother is at Liberty right now, my sister's online. I took some classes from Liberty, so we love Liberty University. Um, like I said, I took some classes at Liberty University online and I loved it. It was very easy, especially for my lifestyle because it's eight week terms and it's like Monday to Monday, so you have plenty of time throughout the week to get your work done. So I feel like it's very great if you're considering an online school. I actually have some points here to prove to you how great it is. There's over 700 residential and online degrees to choose from, which is so fun because you can really find what you want to do. I actually took Christian leadership and management classes because I love Christian leadership, but I also knew I needed a little bit more knowledge on the management side and business side of things. So you really can find whatever fits you and you can turn your passions into a career. They have more than 450 online degrees from associate to doctoral level. Classes start every eight weeks, like I said. All courses are taught from a biblical perspective, which is really cool. So if you're looking to really grow your faith while you're in college, this is the perfect place for you to go. It's ranked in the top 1% out of 2,100 online colleges and universities for academic quality, affordability, and accessibility by bestcolleges.com. And if you're looking to attend in person, it's a very beautiful campus. I've been several times. They have 7,000 plus acres on their campus. Um, 
Um, they have amazing facilities, great classrooms, really great and in real sports places. Um, they even have this like turf snow mountain and it's super, super cool that you can ski and uh, tube down. So it's just a great place to live and to go for college. Uh, so start your future now. Go to liberty.edu slash Sadie. And because you're a Whoa That's Good listener, you'll also get your application fee waived. So friends, don't wait. Go to liberty.edu slash Sadie now and get started on your future today. Um, whenever you were talking about your own um, struggle with homosexuality and just laying that down and everything, I love how you said, I actually, I listened to Gay Girl Good God on audiobooks, which nice. I highly recommend because you reading it is so powerful and it's very poetic. But whenever you said Jesus did not endure because he was strong, he endured because he loved God. Uh, mm. I literally rewinded and made Christian come listen. I was like, this is so good. Um, and I feel like that was almost like a, that was like almost a forward to this book. It was like that, mm. that's what this is all about. What did, like, what was that moment in your life when you realized that like, it's not about like, not doing this, this, and this, but it's actually about just like, when I love God, when I know that God is holy, that's what changes Mm me. I think maybe, that's a great question. I think maybe the transition happened after I I was in a really um, toxic church environment for Mm -hmm. a couple years when I was a new Christian. And it was all about works. Mm -hmm. It, It was just you have to make sure you evangelize every day. Like every person you meet, you have to give them the gospel. And if you don't give them the gospel, then you're fearful and you're a coward. That means you're in sin and you need to repent. <laughs> and that's kind of hard for somebody like me who's introverted, right? Yeah. And so I'm feeling like I'm being a coward when I'm really just being myself. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like they didn't say, oh, maybe you're gifted to give the gospel through books yes. or through music or through art. Like it's like, oh, I have to do, be a street preacher. Or if you didn't read the Bible for a certain amount of time, or if you were on Facebook for too long, it was just works, 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 Mm -hmm. works until I stumbled on a verse in Jude. It's the doxology where Jude says now to him who was able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless and blameless before his glorious, glorious presence with great joy. And that was the first time I saw in the scripture, I said, wait, Mm -hmm. wait, me being kept and me being presented blameless like is on God. It's not as if I'm I'm a passive participant, right? Mm. But it's like all of the glory at the end of the day when I stand before God will be on God. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I, and I think that set me free wow. to be like, oh man, I could just trust him and be with him and he's going to finish the work in me that he started. Yeah. And so I don't know. I guess that's wow. where it started. That's really cool. Yeah. I love that yeah. like you were reading Jude and I know that you, you've written a Bible study on that. And that's yeah. just really cool in and of itself. But I think that just speaks to people about like, if you get in the word of God, it's active and alive. And when you read the word, something so like a verse that may not have spoken to anyone else that day spoke to you. It's like God just yeah. enlightened your eyes to see it and changed your life. It, it led yeah. you to where you are now. And so I think that's a really cool uh, thing to know that, you know, it really is active and alive. You really can read, pick up your Bible sure. one day and it can change your life. Um, so I know that whenever I've written books or whatever, done anything like the message really impacts my life. Like I had to impact my life, you know, in some way for me to want to write or even have the ability to write so many words. And of course it's the Holy Spirit doing a work in you. In this book, you really didn't talk a lot about yourself. You really just talked about God, which I think was really, really cool because you're talking about the holiness of God. Um, was that an intentional thing to not really put yourself in it and how did it impact you along the way of writing it? Yeah. Even in my preaching, um, I, I don't use illustrations about me often Mm. or my family. And I don't think it's a, a problem to do it. I think it's a way of guarding myself, Hmm. you know, from I I think when you're in a space, a Christian celebrity space, especially you are so easily praised Mm -hmm. that part of me, part of me has kind of been become more intentional of how can I keep people 
from putting me on a pedestal that I don't belong to stand on, mm. you know, like I, that I don't deserve that. And so part of it is just me guarding myself and guarding my audience mm-hmm. uh, from being more impressed with me than they are God. Wow. And uh, really yeah, good. and especially a book about holiness is just like, I want this book to last and be impactful when Jackie is dead and gone, like mm-hmm. the likes of C.S. Lewis or uh, A.W. Tozer or uh, just all the ancient voices like Mm -hmm. i don't know they they've left us something that's beautiful because they left us more of god than themselves yep that's so good well you did it you did a great job doing that because this book definitely will live on um this is maybe a hard question, and I wasn't really even thinking about asking this. So you I like can, hard questions. Okay, good. Because, I mean, you can <laughs> always just say, I don't want to answer that. And I'd be like, cool, yeah. moving on. Um, yeah. But I feel like whenever I read Gay Girl, Good God, it gave me, like, a lot of, I don't know, it just made me have more understanding um, from the homosexual, like, lifestyle and where you were coming from and what led you to even be in the relationships that you were in. And you also talk about like how Christians treated you, how they like they saw you as maybe your sin instead of who you really were in that time, like and even reflecting back and who you are now, like what would you tell the church on how we can do better about that topic and treating people who are in a homosexual lifestyle? Because I feel like that's a really interesting uh, topic conversation and coming from you who's actually walked through it. I'd just love to hear your perspective. It's so hard um, because the Christian church and I would be I want to be specific in saying a lot of people who have been the most outlandish and outrageous and quite frankly, sinful Mm. towards the LBGTQ community. I don't even think many of them are actually Christian. Mm. You know, I think they they profess it, but they don't necessarily have the works that prove it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, we got wheat and tares in the church. But I, th- I do think that Christians have not led the way in terms of kindness yeah. and empathy uh, and understanding mm. in this conversation. I think the hard part, though, is, is that even our definitions of kindness and compassion are becoming misconstrued, where to tell the truth about uh, Romans 1 or 1 Corinthians 6 is not looked at as compassionate mm. anymore. So it's, it's becoming hard to discern what kindness actually is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but I Truly. but I think my my counsel will be one, we need the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? Because kindness is a fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Gentleness is a fruit of the spirit. Self control, meaning you don't gotta say everything that comes to your mind is a fruit of the spirit. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, right. I think we do it so wrong so many times because we're doing this stuff in the flesh. That's right. And, and not in the spirit. Um, I think another thing is information, like reading books listening to people, asking questions. What is, even in the trans conversation, if someone asks you, what does it mean to be a man? Mm -hmm. Do you know? Mm -hmm. Can you answer that question? Mm -hmm. Apart from cultural stereotypes about what manhood is. Will you say, oh, well, a man is to be, uh, they ride trucks. Really? Mm -hmm. That's what manhood is to you? Mm -hmm. Is that what God was saying when he made Adam? That you're a man because you drive a truck? You get what I'm saying? Like, I don't think we're educated enough And so we're unable to even engage in these conversations in a way that's informative, but also spirit led. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. I don't even know if that answers your question. It does. It does. So I don't know if you've heard of Samaritan's Purse or not, but it is an amazing organization that gives to people all around the world. Maybe you've heard of them from Operation Christmas Child, and that's where you pack the shoeboxes and send them all over the world. And we've done that several times as a family at the schools that I've gone to. And it really just is an amazing way to make people's day. But they don't only do that. They do so many different things. Like specific to us, Louisiana has been hit by some major hurricanes the past few years. And there have been volunteers down here for really the past few years, removing mold, tearing out drywall, and helping people rebuild their homes to get back on their feet. So just all in all, they respond to people's needs around the world and it is an incredible thing. Um, For instance, Germany was recently hit with the historic flooding, the worst in actually 60 years, which some of us might not even know about. But Samaritan's Purse has been mudding at homes and providing people with emotional and spiritual support to help cover them. Um, And another example, Dio, it was a three-year-old little boy from Uganda who had a life saving heart surgery here in the United States. And the only reason that was made possible is because of Samaritan's Purse. So they are incredible at meeting the needs of so many people around the world in so many different scenarios. Samaritan's Purse is an 
international relief organization that helps hurting people all over the world, and they do it in the name of Jesus Christ. For over 50 years, Samaritan's Purse has been there to help people, whether it's poverty, war, famine, or just whatever it is, to respond to the needs of people. They love Jesus, they love the gospel, and they preach it everywhere they go by their actions. Here's what I need you to do. Go to samaritanspurse.org slash woe and find out how you can get involved with this ministry. Trust me, these are incredible testimonies, and there's so many more of what God's doing all around the world through these people. So again, go to samaritanspurse.org slash woe to learn more. That's samaritanspurse.org slash woe or click the link in my show notes. And one thing that really stuck with me, as you said, I was taught more about sin than about joy. Like I was met more. Yes. And I was like, uh, yeah, that's a real problem. Um, that's true. And so. I forgot I put that there. Yeah. No, you said so. I'm telling you, <laughs> I have like, this is like the back of this book is notes that I took. The My notes on my phone are full. I didn't even know what to ask you today because I'm like, I just, this is just so good. And I just feel like you you say so many things that people need to hear with truth and with love. And um, you actually talk about that a lot in your book about love. And I, I love how you said, um, one thing that you said is how we make love God and not God love, which God is love, but we make love our right. God. I mean, you just had so much good stuff. And one thing that you talked about that I really want you to expand on more is, or even tell people about, is you talked about how we like to cling to the attribute of God that is love, but not the other attributes mm-hmm. of God. And that mm-hmm. was really true. And I think that that kind of plays a part in how we do things sometimes. Is like, if it's love, then it can't be, you know, offensive or yeah. what, whatever it is. Yeah. And so, what do you think that lesson in and of itself can teach people? You are really good at this. <laughs> um, super thoughtful questions. Um, yeah, I, I was reading this book. I don't even remember the title of it. It's, it's cited in Holier Than Now. But he was saying that we are prone to like esteem the attributes of God that we most relate to. Mm. So we don't relate to God's eternality, mm-hmm. right? The fact that he there with him, there is no beginning. There is no end with us. There is a beginning. And so we don't relate to that. That's why we, mm-hmm. we're not like, yeah, God is eternal. Yeah. Like we just, we don't, we don't even tattoo that on our arms or nothing. <laughs> um, and so when it comes to love, if we do hear that God is love, we don't allow God's nature to define love we instead take our experiences of love and then project that onto how God should be. Mm. And that's a part of the problem is that if God is love, that means that God also defines it. Yeah. Not even necessarily in terms of what he said, but what he's done. Mm. Well, how do we know what love is? The gospel. Mm. God loved us so much that he sent his son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish. Uh, what greater love is it that a man yeah. laid down his life for his, his son, right? And so love is not yeah. this sentimental, self-centered, arrogant, I can do whatever I want kind of ethic. Love is completely servant hearted underneath the Lordship of Christ. That's love. Come on. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited for people to listen to this. I really am. (laughs) It's so good. What do you hope people take away when they read Holier Than Thou? I mean, I think that there's so much, but if you could put it in a nutshell. Yeah. Holiness is intimidating, Mm -hmm. Um, especially depending on how it's been presented to you. If holiness has always been, you know, God is holy and you ain't, so you're going to hell. Nobody wants to read books that sound like that. That's right. No, (laughs) no. It's just not, I want to read the books about love, if that's the case. And so one, I want to widen our understanding of holiness, which is to say, man, if God is holy, that means he is always good. Yeah. If God is holy, that means he cannot sin. Mm. If God cannot sin, that means he cannot sin against you. Mm -hmm. If God cannot sin against you, then that makes him the most trustworthy being there is. Mm. And I think when you frame it that way, then you see, oh, holiness is something worth worshiping about. Yeah. Because imagine if God wasn't holy, Mm. what would he be like? Wow. He would be like the devil. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. That would be a scary thing to have an eternal sovereign God that is satanic in his ways. That would be terrifying. It would be terrifying. It would be terrifying. It would be hell. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But in all actuality, we have a God that is just good all the time and all the time he's good. So that's what I want people to walk away with. It's Mm -hmm. just a bigger understanding of God that affects how they live their life. That's That's so great. I love it. You know, I'll be honest. This book actually even intimidated me because holiness is intimidating. Like just even the word, it, it seems like 
I think what it seems like is maybe this other attributes of God. It seems like it's going to go over your head. It's like, I don't really understand that completely. And when people explain it, sometimes it does go over your head. But you did it in such a beautiful way that's relatable, but also draws you deeper. And I think people are going to be super, super impacted by that. And ultimately... I think the biggest thing in what you talk about in so much of both of your books is that if we just knew the character of God, if we just actually focus on the beauty of God and the glory of God and the goodness of God and just who God is, then our life would really fall more into place. And if we if we didn't like we started to focus on that and not focus on the what we can do, what we can't do, what we shouldn't do, what we should be, right. what we're not, all the different things. Um, and I love that quote. It was at the end of your book. It said, we don't need more books that tell us what we shouldn't be doing. We need more books on the beauty of God. And I was like, come yes. on. It's so good. That's it. That's it. That's right it. there. It's it. Well, I mean, I really could talk to you all day, but I guess we'll stop there because I feel like people are already going to be getting so much um, truth spoken to them. And I hope that if anything, I mean, I could quote your whole book, but I hope that I don't do that here <laughs> and people go actually buy Holier Than Thou, go read Gay Girl or Good God, or listen to an audio because that was really awesome. And just yeah. dive into things that Jackie said because your ministry is very impactful. And you just, like you said, you don't point people to you, you point people to God. And that is why lives are changed when they listen. So thank you for who you are and all that you do and um i can't even believe you're doing all this and you're pregnant so hello that's awesome you you did it i know we, all over here we, i, we I saw you the other day i said she going to amusement parks <laughs> and all this stuff with new babies <laughs> oh you a gosh. real one hey that was a real one i'm gonna tell you i needed the spirit on that one that was crazy <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 courageous. That was truly. courageous for real. No, yeah. but thank you, Jackie. You you're awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. It was good to talk to you.